I want to be an actress. I'm thinking director. Yep, that's what I want to do. What's the difference between a DP and a cinematographer? What does a producer actually do? How do I get in? Who do I need to know? It's time to ask your questions. We're here for you. Welcome to 101, a podcast for young women interested in careers in film and TV. We'll sit down with industry professionals, ask them your questions, and get the answers you need to know. 101, it's, it's a beginning. beginning. Hi guys, welcome to 101, a podcast. Uh, we have the honor of having a very, very special guest today, James Redding. Tell us, what is your occupation? My occupation is based in audio post-production for film and television. I span a couple of different occupations within that field. I do sound effects editing, I do sound design, I do re-recording mixing. I also do dialogue editing, ADR recording and editing, Foley recording and editing, and also just going out and capturing sound effects uh, in general. So when people ask me what I do, I say I make noise for a living. <laughs> for people who are just starting out and people who are learning about the whole process, can you just kind of simplify what you do? The way I like to start it for most people who don't quite understand is when a movie is shot or a television show is shot, they are trying to just capture the voice while capturing the picture. So though the picture might be a wide shot, they are trying to just capture what's coming out of the actor's mouth. It is then my job to make sure that you hear that clearly, but also build the sonic world that the film or story is taking place in. Um, if you take something like The Avengers or you know The Hobbit, which most of the stuff is now being shot on green screen, they're not even out in the real world, they're just on a sound stage. I create that world sonically. So all those visuals look great, but your brain won't quite believe them unless they fall into uh, sort of a subject category in your head of what it should sound like. So I create those sounds by taking other sounds and manipulating them or just capturing sounds that we already know and love. Like if you're out in the woods, I'll go out and record, you know, some blue jays and some sparrows and put that around you. Every sonic possibility in a film or television show can actually be sort of controlled. Um, and we actually put it all in in layers. So that that's sort of diving a little deeper into what I do. Yeah, and I guess every job is different. Can you explain what Foley is for anybody who doesn't know what that means? Foley, Foley is the other fun thing that people always think about when we talk about sound, right? They think about music and then they think about Foley just because they've seen some of the behind the scenes things. And so Foley is the art, is actually known as Foley art, and they are known as Foley artist of performing sounds uh, tend to be natural sounds in sync with picture. It's ways of adding layers to make it more realistic, just like a painting. If you're watching a film or television show, my goal whenever I'm constructing uh, a scene is that you should be able to close your eyes and still see the scene. Yeah, and once those layers are all in there, before you know it, it's like this whole thing has been created and you're just like, wow, this really works. It's one of those things I always find elevates projects. Um, working on a lot of indie films and working on, you know, student films back when I was in college. And the thing that changes them from being what we call indie or what we call low budget and stuff like that is being able to sonically boost them. Um, most of the time they run out of money by the time they get to post-production or they just don't understand the importance of sound because they've never been taught. But once you make it pal pal palatable to the ears, your brain is a lot uh, is very forgiving of it then. You know, your picture can be shaky and everything else, but if it sounds bad, you sort of turn it off. So by elevating your sound, you're all of a sudden putting this nice polish on it, making it look more professional. It's such an unknown universe. It's so instinctual in us. Uh, the hearing world takes it for granted. And there's so many instincts in us due to sound. A baby crying is actually at a certain frequency that alerts us right? It's actually the same frequency that also can tell us whether something's dangerous or not. So when you you're using low frequencies and things, it can cause a sense of confusion because you can't locate where it is. Whereas your ears are usually really good at, you know, you hear a bird chirp within a few seconds, you can figure out where that bird is just by moving your head a little bit. These things are just instinctually in us that people don't realize how they work and therefore they don't realize how they help when trying to tell a story. And that, that's, as a professor, at NYU, that's one of the things I try to instill in my students. People think about sound before they go for their shoots and, and think about working with the other departments too. Work with your art department, work with your set department, work with you know your carpenters to construct what you need. 
you know, it just makes your project that more, much more powerful. You are so passionate about what you do, James. And I think it's just contagious. I'm like, maybe I'll do so. Well, let's let's kind of go back a little bit. What was the moment like when you knew that you wanted to be in the industry? I kind of always been interested in audio. Um, you know, in high school, I wanted to be in a band. I was like, you know, I had the long hair. I know, surprising now. Um, but I had the long hair. I had the low slung guitar. I used to go out and rock out and all that other stuff. But then I, I started recording my friends. And uh, actually, a neighbor of mine who is a, a record producer for jazz records gave me an old two-track recorder uh, analog. And I always thought that was fun. And then um, I went to college and I was an English major for about a semester. And then I hated Shakespeare. So I got out of that. And I moved into television radio. So I went to Ithaca College and I worked on WICB and it was a lot of fun. And then I did, um, Ithaca has a program where you can study abroad. And my abroad was Los Angeles, which I know some people live in Los Angeles, but to me, it was very abroad being a New Yorker. It was a different world. And I happened to find this company called Dane Tracks, uh, which was run by Dane A. Davis, who is a supervising sound editor. So I went there and interviewed and met with Dane. And it was a very small company, maybe like 20 people, not even. And they happened to be working on this little project called The Matrix. And I remember being like, okay. And Dane was like, you can't tell anybody about this movie. And I'm like, okay, I don't, who knows? And it had Keanu Reeves in it. It was before Keanu's like big comeback. Like he had done Bill and Ted's and stuff. And I remember watching some of the takes and just being like, this is really cool. And Dane, what was so amazing about Dane was that he made it even cooler because he's like, all right, so we have to make up the sound for bullet time. We're traveling at the speed of a bullet what does the world sound like when you do that? And so we went and took things and we stretched them long and all this other stuff. One of our sound editors is redoing the bathroom. We're going to go smash it and record it. And so we went and smashed the daylights out of the bathroom and, uh, oh, the helicopter flies into a building and explodes. We're going to go pick up televisions and explode them. And I'm not talking like flat screen TVs. I'm talking like the old 1980s, 90s tube TVs that had vacuums in them. And when you break that vacuum, it implodes with this large boom. And so we went and bought a bunch of those and exploded those. And I was just like, this is really cool. Excuse my language. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on your (laughs) podcast. You can beep that. I can supply the beep if you need it. Um, But... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was like, this is so cool. This is it. And when I got back to New York and got back to college, Dane was like, stay, finish the movie with me. And I'm like, ah, I grew up in middle class New York. I have to go and finish my degree. And I, I went back to Ithaca. And when I got back, I, I still had the rest of my junior year and my whole senior year to do. And all I did was film sounds. And from there, it's history. I just, I've been doing it for 21 years now. Oh my God. That's incredible. I'm sorry. I just got chills, like the whole story. Seriously. And that, that, that small film, that indie film that you were doing. <laughs> that happened to win an Oscar, you know. Uh, <laughs> what? Not winning an Oscar, just to be clear, Dane, Dane and crew did. I was just the lowly intern who happened to be a fly on the wall. I mean, working with the Wachowskis was awesome because they their minds were on such a different level as far as filmmaking and their ideas of how we're going to bend this world was, was so great to be witness of. Maybe we can talk about like your most recent job, um, your most recent gig. What are your day-to-day responsibilities? If you can just walk through like a, a day in a life of James Redding. <laughs> uh, my most recent jobs have been, I've done a couple of TV shows recently for Showtime, uh, City on the Hill season two, though I did also did season one, and I'm doing American Rust now also for Showtime. And I'm moving on to an NBC show called Mr. Mayor uh, in a couple of weeks. For all these shows, I'm doing sound effects editorial, um, which means that I'm curating sounds from a library that I've either already bought or going out and recording and placing them in sync with the picture. So when you see a city, I put in the sound of a city. You see a car go by, I put in the sound of a car go by. Uh, My typical day, uh, you know, starting at the beginning of each episode is get up, make sure I have the files that I need to get um, one way or another. Um, I pop them into a program called Pro Tools, which is what a a digital audio workstation I happen to use and most of the industry uses. And I have a a track layout of uh, how many stereo sounds I need, how many surround sounds I need, how many mono sounds I need. Now, these are all just different file configurations of where we can place the sound 
in your listening field. I start with the backgrounds and I start laying out the show that way. I go scene to scene of where is this taking place? Where is this taking place? Where is this taking place? And then my next step is to go in and say, okay, what are the other usual things that happen? Somebody's knocking on something, a glass being picked up or put down, and I'll go and put those elements in. And then usually towards the end of the episode or project, I'll go in and put in what I call emotional sounds. And these are sounds that I'm using to heighten an emotional state. And I'll add in like either a low hit or uh, a sound that might have uh, something that's going across both your left and right ear to cause confusion because, oh, what's going on here? You know, what, what's, what's causing the tension? Now, depending on the project, City on the Hill and American Rust, I get about 10 days to edit in for an hour's worth of drama. When I was working on Queen's Gambit, my main focus was backgrounds. And it was, what kind of feeling are we supposed to be getting from this place? You know, in some shows, it's just a city is a city is a city. But in like shows like Queen's Gambit or City on the Hill or even American Rust, we're like, okay, Beth Harmon's going into a basement. She's scared. How do we make this basement scary? Right. And, and, and it's partially in those backgrounds, you know, but the typical day is, you know, wake up, grab a cup of coffee, make some noise. Love it. So you are a member of IATSE, correct? Correct. I am part of uh, Local 700, which is known as the Motion Pictures Editors Guild. IATSE does uh, craft services. They do script writers. They do uh, set designers, hair and makeup, everything. Local 700 is strictly for post-production. Um, going with the picture editors, visual effects artists. Um, we're trying to get animators in there, though that's been a little sticky. Um, trying to get post producers in there, colorists, um, and that sort that put everything together at the end. We're probably the second largest part of IATSE. And James, do you work with an agent? Is it common for people in the post production and sound world to work with? An agent or? From what I understand, the West Coast tends to have more agents for their picture editorial department. Sound does not necessarily have agents. We tend to get our jobs more just by making the rounds. I think even in the beginning of your career, you're better off going and making connections. There's plenty of places to do that. Um, there's a group called the Blue Collar Post Collective where you can get together with other post production professionals and meet up and just talk shop. Some people enter the union thinking, oh, they're going to get me jobs. No, they're, they're not going to get you jobs. They're going to make sure what jobs you have are at scale and that you're treated fairly. Um, but it is not their job to get you a job. So with all of that, what's the best part of your job? The best part of my job, I find, is when I get to describe to other people what my job is. You know, a lot of people walk out during credits. A lot of people, you know, the streaming platforms all shrink the credits down. You're kind of missing how many people put their work into something. I love talking to kids about it. Um, I got to do a demonstration for my daughter's class last year during the pandemic. Her music class was doing sound for film and television. And my daughter was like, oh, my dad worked on the Queen's Gambit. And her teacher like flipped the lid and was like, oh my God, we got to get them on. So I brought up one of my sessions and showed them what I can do and how I can control things. And they were just blown away by it. So it's, I think what I liked about that was like, it's that pure enjoyment of like, oh, wow, he just made a T-Rex sound. That's so cool. <laughs> What's the uh, most difficult about your job? Everybody hears things differently and you have to learn how to, it, it's, it's like different dialects, right? So you have to learn how to communicate with people about what they're hearing to somebody who's not used to describing what they're hearing. So you're like, okay, are you hearing more blue? Or are you hearing more cold? Are you hearing, you know, like sound is so unknown, right? I, I feel like with picture editorial, they see you move the picture. They see you trim something. They see that movement change. With sound, they feel like we're pulling the wool over their eyes every time we touch something. I will admit sometimes we are, <laughs> but you know, it's, they, since they can't feel it or see it necessarily, they don't think we're doing it. They don't think you're you're applying their notes sometimes. I just got that recently. It was like, I'm, I'm doing what you're saying. It, exactly. And they, they think like, oh, well, you didn't do it. No, I did do what you said. But what you said wasn't what you wanted. And when I tried telling you that, you got mad at me. So you have to find that fine line of 
what they're hearing and what you're hearing and what you're doing and let them know that they can trust you. And, and building trust like anything, it, it's a hard thing to do. So that's probably the most difficult part. It's like, I've designed some of the coolest sounds that you've never heard because somebody else is like, I don't like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like, okay. And you got part of the job. Yeah. Or the job. And you got to learn how to like be Zen, you know, learn some armchair yoga and breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth and just be cool with it. And sometimes your first takes are like what they want in the end. I had a, a scene one time where it was a car chase scene and I worked my butt off on it. I mean, it was like a seven minute car chase in a TV show and it was nuts. I mean, cut after cut after cut and car screeching and everything else. And uh, TV shows are a little bit different than film. Film, it's one editor, one director, and they're usually the the powerhouses of the film. They're usually the driving creative force. TV shows, because episode after episode after episode has to be done, there tends to be a team of editors, each one taking on a different episode usually, and then a showrunner, who's not even the director, who is just in charge of making sure that the overall tone of at least the season is done a certain way. So on this one TV show, you know, we had three different editors, right? And they're rotating. As a sound crew, I'm working on every episode. So consistency wise, I know sound, how it goes. Whereas each episode, they're like, well, I like this. I like that. I, and you're like, okay, but for consistency, this is the sound of their car. This is the sound of their house. So anyway, we get into this car chase sequence and the picture editor was allowed to come in and they had four hours to go through. And they basically said, nope, I like what I did in my picture edit better. I was so distraught. I was like, I spent two days cutting seven minutes of audio. And I made a killer car chase, but okay. You know, you've only worked on rom-coms before I've worked on action pieces, but we're cool. Um, and then the showrunner came the next day and we played through the same sequence and the showrunner goes, no, 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 this is all wrong. This is boring. I don't, I don't feel excitement by this. And I said, hold on one second. And I muted all the sound at picture editor stuff. unmuted my stuff. I said, can we try this? And I hit play. Yes. You know, and it, and it's so frustrating because you're trying to do your job. And, and this is where I think something that needs to change in our industry. And it, it's gone. It's kind of a pendulum swing because I believe it used to be this way more where we're all trying to make the best product. Like I don't, I try not to have an ego. My work is not for me. It's for the masses to enjoy your story. It's trying to convince people of like, we're, we're all working for the same common goal. I had a long talk with my students uh, at NYU last week with the IATSE is asking for a strike authorization at this time, um, which is a very big deal. And I'm like, whether you're for the union or you're not, that is up to you. It doesn't matter. I don't care about that. But you have to recognize that the union as a whole, what it does, at least for people, is it helps pull us all up. Right. They set a scale rate when my students say, what should I what should I you know, do this rate for? And I'm like, all right, well, you're a student. You should start probably here. But once you've been in the business for a couple of years, look at the wages scale and go up to that. Even if you're not in the union, it, it should be like that. And like, you know, you should be deciding your rate. I mean, it's just hard because you need work if you need work. And it's just like a catch 22 in a way. It's really difficult. Oh, it, it totally is. And it, it's one of those things too. You know, I mean, look, I have a scale that I, I have my friends and family discount. I have my, I really like this project discount. I have my, no, you have a studio backing you discount. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Each project just, just dictates. Yeah. All right. You know, each, each project has its own sort of thing and I'm willing to negotiate all of it, but I do have to set, like, if I'm going to take a lower rate, then I need something on return. More time with my family, a longer schedule. We all have to respect ourselves and you have to respect that. Like, look, my rate is based on the idea that I've worked for 21 years I've studied for 25 years, right? I did all my college studies on this and I continue to study audio. So you, you gotta have that modicum of respect for yourself. One thing I, I, I love that you touched on um, is how to kind of navigate what your rate is. And it's, it's something that specifically for this podcast, we really want to touch on because we want specifically young women to feel 
confident in talking about what their rate is and, and feel empowered to ask for what they need um, and what they can expect. But it's something that we wanna normalize and to kind of empower young women um, in, these, in this industry or who are interested in this industry to, to discuss. So when you are starting out, say like you're an intern or you're getting your first gig, like what's a rough estimate of what you can expect to earn? And then, you know, if you don't mind kind of touching on moving up from there, like mid career, and then like, you know, being very advanced in the career. Sure. Um, starting out, I do think if you're in college and you get your internship there, there's been a lot of debate now of whether or not uh, interns should be paid. If you can get college credit for it, it kind of becomes this pay to play thing that people get very upset about. But having had such a strong college internship experience, I actually, that money that semester spent out in LA doing the matrix was so well spent. I think once you're out of college, you should at least be going for, I mean, remember, if, you, if you've taken classes on this, if you paid for any sort of course on this, you've invested. So now is when you should start reaping on that investment. You should probably start somewhere around like whatever your best summer job was. And you add maybe five bucks on top of that. My first job was night studio assistant and I was making 7.25 an hour to work two, uh, 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. in New York and then try to commute back to Long Island. I would stay there until you feel like you've had a modicum of su success where you feel like you've done enough to garner bumping up. And then it becomes, are you staying freelance or are you going staff somewhere? If you're going staff, you're going to be getting different benefits that become part of the pay package. As horrible as that is, that's the way corporate America works nowadays. If you're going to be freelance, you're going to have to bump that up a little bit more. Um, because as a freelancer, you don't know where your next gig is going to come from. And unless you're part of the union, you don't really have health insurance. You got to take that into account. And then what I would do is, you know, if somebody on staff is making $25 an hour, just for reference, as a freelancer, I'd say 35, at least maybe 40. And that's really though. I mean, I, I don't think you're even touching that area until you're probably at least five years into your career. You know, and that's depending on what you've been doing during those five years. My career path was definitely a little weird. I started as the night studio assistant for six months. And then I got bumped up to uh, afternoon mix technician where I got to sit with the mixers every day and actually do a little work. And then after about a year and a half total in the industry, I was mixing and editing shows on my own. But everybody's path is different. But I'd say probably five years in is when you start being like, all right, I need to really consider living off of this. I think a lot of us artists don't go into this to be money rich. We go into it to be creatively rich. In fact, when I don't get to be creative, my wife is like, wow, you're hell. It's about finding that balance. What do you think needs to change in the industry? One that is a very hot topic now, but has always been a topic dear to me is that you have to suffer to be in the industry. <laughs> I, I hate the idea that like, Oh no, I, you know, you have to do so many hours on set or yada, yada. I mean, I worked for a filmmaker who will remain nameless that kept me in the studio for 72 hours straight. And I, I was mentally broken at the end of it. Right now, IATSE is, is in negotiations. And one of the biggest sticking points for some people that don't want to authorize a strike at this moment, that don't want to stand up to certain things is that they like the overtime. And I'm like, okay, but if we get better wages, you will make that money over more days. You shouldn't have to spend 16 hours on set. You should be able to stop and pick it up tomorrow. That's the whole point of the continuity people. That's the whole point of script supervisors. We have a whole bunch of jobs whose job is is so that you can pick it up the next day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like we, we got to stop this like, oh, showbiz, it's rough. Like it shouldn't be. It's all about planning. It is. And, you know, we've talked to other people and they say the same thing. You know, one woman is a, a, a new mom. There should be a life along with work. So, and, and I think part of it is just our, our societal ways. I, I, I don't think this is just a problem in our industry, but I think it's very rampant in our industry. 
And I think that there, in our industry, there's a lot of fear and um, tolerance of, of toxic behavior. It's like, oh, this person is talented so they can act like an asshole. And it's like, well, no. And in any other office setting, you would be fired and probably brought up on charges. It's a level of respect that needs to be um, taken on by more people um, respecting one another and everyone's talents. And we could talk about this forever because so much <laughs> needs to be changed. But Meredith, take the last question because it's the best. Okay. Is there just that, that one film, that one movie? Yes. The film that made me get into the industry is a Luc Besson film called The Fifth Element. Um, back when that film came out, I remember going to see it um, at the Cornell Cinemas. And sound-wise, it is just astounding. I watch that constantly and you can't tell what is dialogue, what is music or what is effect. They all just blend so seamlessly. It's so magical. And like listening back to that soundtrack, I mean, the score is just an amazing- I'm going to watch it this weekend. If anybody, anybody who's listening who has not seen The Fifth Element, do so now. There are some films that I walk out of that I'm just like, Lobster, I loved. Um, Swiss Army Man was just a unique film. But like the film that changed my- view on films was probably fifth element so cool this was so much fun thank you so thank much. you so much i also just want to throw this in here because you're aside from being one of the most talented people i know you are one of the most humble people that i know and i just wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your emmy win Woo! we're so proud of you and proud to know you and have worked with you so to our listeners Look James up on IMDb, James Redding the Third, and check out his work because you will be so happy that you did. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to work with you two again. Oh, for sure. We'll bother you. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll be knocking on your door. 